have even called on God, before you can even pursue God, God says, I'm there for you. In fact, I'm already pursuing you. I love you so much, even though you don't even know about me, I'm going to pursue you until I wake you up. Why do you serve God? For the gifts that He gives to you? For your reward in heaven? Or do you really love Him? It's when I fell in love with God, He did a new thing in my life. See, a Christian is someone who's under the influence of the Holy Spirit at the present moment. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Did you enjoy that special music? Jim and Fran, I, you got my heart right from the start. Under his wing, I am what? Safely abiding. That's, that's what God's trying to do with each and every one of us, is just get him under his wing, you know. And the problem that he has with Jim Homer, he likes to peek out every now and then and get himself a little bit of trouble. I enjoyed that medley, I, and I mean that. I really did. It touched my heart. And I don't know where the choir director went in the choir, but I told your pastor, I said, I'm sorry, pastor, but I'm taking him home with me. They did a lovely job, didn't they? I mean, to hear that uplifting music to bring you to the throne of grace really touches my heart as a speaker, especially before I go up in the pulpit, because I need it just as much as you do. And your children's story. Oh, I like the person that was given it. <laughs> I'm afraid this is my corner right now, honey. <laughs> this is my corner. I'd like to be where she is right now. I like her. She's, I'm kind of soft on her. Have you noticed that? She, I'm in love with her. You know, I, don't, I didn't say I love her. I said I'm in love with her, gentlemen. When I say goodbye to my wife, I don't say love you. I say, I love you. <laughs> There's a difference, isn't there? It's not past tense, it's presence. I love that girl. Well, I want to talk to you today from uh, some chapters in my book, Escape to God. I don't know how, how many of you have read this. So you already have a little bit of a feeling what we're going to talk about, don't you? But this book really isn't the issue, because this book is really taken from this book. And all this book is, is really my understanding of the practical application of God's word to Jim Holmberger's heart. But it isn't just God's word to my heart, it's also his spirit. God doesn't leave us alone in this world to just adapt ourselves to his word. He gives us a spirit, too, to accompany us day in and day out. And as we learn his word and we learn to listen to his spirit, God guides us through our days. I want to talk to you about my God today. and He's, he's quite a God. I'm really in love with him. The text that was shared for the opening text was Isaiah 65, 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, he says, what? Before you have even called on God, before you can even pursue God, God says, I'm there for you. In fact, I'm already pursuing you. I love you so much, even though you don't even know about me, I'm going to pursue you till I wake you up. And then once I wake you up, I'm going to continue to pursue you till I've got 25% of your heart and 50% of your heart and 75 and until I've got 100% of your heart, I'm going to continue the pursuit of your heart and your life. That's my God. And he says, while your prayers are coming up to me, I'm already listening to you. I'm not busy running the universe. I'm busy watching you. What a God. I mean, what a God. How can you not love that kind of a God? And after he gets 100% of your heart, he doesn't say, it's over. He doesn't look at us and say, love you. <laughs> not my God. He says, I'm in love with my people. Doesn't matter if you obey me or disobey me, I'm in love with you. In fact, while you were yet a sinner, I sent my son to die for you before you could even accept me. Now, how can't you love that kind of a God? It breaks my heart. It excites me. It's adrenaline to my uh, blood system. So I want to talk to you to, today about God. You know, when I first heard about God, I read about God and his word. And I found God's word a book of systematic theology. You know that? My first Bible study was in Daniel and Revelation, and they showed me who the, who the beast was. And I fell in love with God's Word as a book of systematic theology, and that's part of what this book is about. But if all you get out of God's Word is systematic theology, you have missed it. Utterly missed it, brothers and sisters. This is the greatest love story ever written. <laughs> Hollywood, eat your hearts out. God is after his people. 
And this is the story about God pursuing you and me every day of our lives. And I want to talk about that pursuit this morning. I'd like to illustrate it from a situation I had in my life. And as many of you know, we've moved up into the wilderness in 1983. I was a successful businessman. I'd come into God's realm in the church. I accepted his word. I accepted the diet, the lifestyle. But I was missing something. I wasn't treating my wife right. I wasn't treating my children right. So we moved up in the mountains to find an experience in 1983. We had three years of income to live on, which was $18,000. So we divided 18,000 in three, and we lived on $6,000 a year for three years. Yeah, ooh, ouch, oatmeal, I don't like it anymore. <laughs> and so in that process, I had to de develop a, a way of living in the wilderness, and God led me to open up a wilderness real estate practice up next to Glacier National Park, 50 miles up a gravel road, 50 miles from power, where bears and grizzly bears and elk and moose live, and that man never treads. And I became very successful at it by God's blessing. And in 1988, a fellow by the name of Warren and his wife Sharon came into my back door and they sat in my living room. And Warren was from San Francisco. He was a CPA. And he came up there because he wanted to find a refuge from the life in San Francisco. And as he was sitting on my couch, he was telling me, he says, my wife is expecting a son. And we're excited, but we don't want to just raise him in San Francisco. We want him to bring him up in here in the wilderness where we're going to have special father-son outings. Do you have a piece of property that'll suit us? And I said, Warren, I think I have just the exact piece for you. Come on, hop in my truck. And so we got in my vehicle, and we've been talking a little bit. And as we're driving down the road, Warren looks across his wife, and he looks at me, and he says to me, he says, Jim, what are you doing up here anyways? And he said it in such a way to say, why are you wasting your talents up here in the wilderness when you'd be making big bucks down in the big city? And see, I'd been up there five years already, and I came there for a reason, didn't I? I came there to find God in my practical walk every day. I came there so I could find a God that would so aid me never to get irritated at my wife ever again. That's freedom, gentlemen. That's really being free. I came there to find a God that would help me to raise up two young men that would be godly men when they went out in the world. They would be able to withstand the immorality and the lust and the filth that there is in this world. I had a purpose. And Warren's looking at me saying, why don't you go back to the city and get some money? And I looked at Warren. I says, Warren, I'm a Christian. He says, stop right there. I'm not a Christian, and I don't want to hear another word about it. You should have felt the cold ice in my vehicle. I couldn't believe what this man was saying to me. The very reason I came to the wilderness was not to sell real estate. It was to get a place up in heaven next to God, next to the throne of grace, so I could be with God the rest of my life. Now this man is telling me, you cannot speak about your God in my own vehicle. How dare he? But I learned one thing. It was in the special music this morning, Jim. Under his wing, I'm safely abiding. And I don't have an answer for this man, but God's got an answer for Warren, not Jim Holmberger. Jim Holmberger isn't smart enough to answer this man. I can't blow out a Bible study right now. I can't give him any of our 27 fundamentals. This man needs some words from on high. And I'm saying, Lord, give me the words to say to this man. I have no idea what I should say. Is that you? Are you dependent upon God at all times and in all places? for everything you're supposed to say? Do you filter every thought and every word through your heavenly Father? It says we're to pray without ceasing, aren't we? Amen. That's what it means. That was the secret of Jesus' life. Jesus never allowed himself to come out. He always depended upon his Father for all the wisdom, all the strength, and all the direction. And as Jesus was, so are we to be. We're to have a connection to the throne of grace on high. God's the power. Not our church, not our knowledge, not our talents or our skills. It's only as we come humbly before God and say, God, I don't have an answer for Warren. Now you give me the answer. And so I'm just praying, and the, and the vehicle was totally silent. And then I looked at Warren, and I says, Warren, all I need is two minutes of your time. And when I'm through, I'll never bring up my God again. Warren, even though you have forbidden me to speak about my God in my vehicle, I want you to know my God loves you. 
And I want you to know that even though you reject my God, someday you're going to need my God, and he will be there for you. You think it was cold in the vehicle before. <laughs> it was downright frigid. Well, Warren bought the property, and he drove off. I want to ask you a question. Is God in pursuit of Warren? Oh, brothers and sisters, yes, he is in pursuit of Warren. He loves Warren. How much of Warren did God have? Nothing at that point. How much, does, how much of Warren does God want? All of him. How much of you does God have today? Wouldn't it be interesting, I was, as they were uh, doing the offering, I was watching these screens up here with the beautiful scenes you had. Wouldn't it be nice now if we put up everybody's name up here, maybe alphabetically, and we could have them come up around the pulpit, and as we put their name up there, we could send an email off to heaven, because I'm sure God has a computer, doesn't he? I don't know if it's Hewlett Packard or what it is, but God, God invented the computer, didn't he? We have poor makeshift ideas of them today. And we'd send off an email to heaven, we'd say, God, show us how much each of us uh, you have of each of us. Who wants to start? <laughs> Boy, it's quiet in here, Pastor. Why? What's going on? You know, when I was writing the sermon, and I was up uh, actually writing the book, I was upstairs in my study, and I, I, I was kind of stuck right here, and the Lord says, I want you to take a walk. So I came out of my home. We live up in the wilderness, little log home, 960 square feet. And we have a gas tank out there because we're so far from a gas station. And as I was walking outside, and I'm looking at that gas tank there, and it's a 300-gallon gas tank, and it's interesting. When I look at that gas tank, I can tell you at one moment's notice how much power is in that tank because there's a little gauge right at the top of the tank. And I can tell instantly if it's 25% full or 50% full or 75 or if it's full of power. And I thought to myself as I was looking at that tank, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if God would install a little gauge on our neck that showed us how, much, how filled we are with God's Spirit today? Wouldn't that be nice? That way when the pastor walks up in the pulpit, you know she'd walk out the back door and listen or she'd stay. Wouldn't that be a good deal? Wouldn't you like people to read your, your gauge? You don't? Why wouldn't you want God reading your, why wouldn't you want your brothers and sisters reading your gauge? You don't have a face on, do you? You're the same person here at church as you are at home behind closed doors, aren't you, gentlemen? You're the same person here as you are as you treat your wife throughout the week, aren't you? Or are you? Or maybe what the gauge should read is what our average has been for the last 30 days. Are you with me? Now, why don't you want that people reading your gauge? If your gauge was full 100% of the time, would you mind it? No, but it isn't, is it? Yeah, we're all encompassed with human infirmity, aren't we? Paul's gauge read 100%, didn't it? Paul, the apostle, says, I'm determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was Paul. What about Caiaphas? Who was Caiaphas? Caiaphas was the what? High priest. We call, what would we call him today? of God's denominated body. We call him the president of God's denominated body. If you were to read Caiaphas's gauge, this is the president of God's denominated body, what would it have read? Zero. Pretty sad, isn't it? Can you believe that? The president of God's church? Now, who were the Pharisees? Were they the liberals or the conservatives? Conservative. Conservative. How many conservatives we got here today, by the way? Got some Pharisees here, past. Not too many of them. But we got some, what would the, what, by the way, I'm a conservative, all right? Just, uh, I'll put up two hands. That's what my friends tell me anyways. How, what would the conservatives' gauges have read? Come on, let's hear it. Not very good. Who were the Sadducees? They were the what? Liberals. How many liberals we got here today? Well, we don't have, oh, one liberal back there. Just one, well, we got two liberals, just two liberals. What are the rest of you, just moderates? I mean, what would, the, what would the liberals' gauges have read? Are you with me? You see, the liberals and the conservatives, in my opinion, have the same problem, and it's not theology. And they had the same problem in Jesus' day. They were in charge, and that's the bottom line issue today. Where are you today? 
If we were to read your gauge, honestly, what would it read? You see, back in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees made their gauge something other than God. And the conservatives and liberals have done that today. They were playing church. And see, many have made their religion the church they belong to. Your religion cannot be the church you belong to. There's a place for the church, and the place for the church is to get out of your way and point you to Jesus Christ. The church is not your salvation. The church can't save one person in the world. All the church can do if it's doing its job right is get out of the way and point you to Jesus who has the power to save. But many make their church their salvation or they make their doctrines, what they believe their salvation. And they'll argue about them in our Bible studies in our schools. But Jesus said in John 5, 39, he says, you search the scriptures for in them ye what? Are you with me? You search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Just as Jesus talking, he says, ye think you have eternal life in just knowing the word of God? Caiaphas probably had a couple PhDs in the word of God. What good did it do him? The devil knows more than all of us do about the word of God. If you just make your doctrines, your religion, you may be no better off than Caiaphas and the devil himself. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't know the word. But the Word has a purpose. The Word is to take you to the Word made flesh Amen. and who dwelt among us and walked in our shoes. What are you making your religion? Maybe it's your attendance at church. Maybe you have perfect attendance. Praise God. I think we should be in love with His Word and His church, and I think we should attend it. But that's not your religion. Or is it? Or maybe it's your outreach. Or maybe it's your reforms. I have a lot of people, when the first time they meet me, they say, you know, I'm a vegan. Well, I'm a vegan too. But my carrots and my bananas don't save me. All they do is allow my mind to be sensitive to His Holy Spirit. And maybe I get a few more years. I'm not a vegan so I can live longer. I'm a vegan so that my mind is clear and fresh and bright and sensitive to the Holy Spirit when it speaks to me. Because if God is speaking, I want to hear His voice. And God never shouts. He always whispers. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way. Why does Isaiah 30 to 21 say, you shall hear a word behind thee? Because God never gets in your face and forces you to do anything. He gently taps you on the shoulder and suggests, Jim, treat your wife gently. He doesn't insist that I do it. He only suggests that I do it. And now by faith I can follow him or my stubborn German personality. What are you doing? What is your gauge of Christianity? John 12, 32 says, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto what? <clears throat> unto me. Jesus said that. My work is not to bring you into a church or a denomination or a body of belief or a bunch of reforms or get you involved in outreach. My work is to connect you with God. If I can connect you with God, he'll take care of the rest. He'll tell you how you should dress. He'll tell you how you should eat. He should tell you what your work is. My work, the work of the minister, is to connect you to God. And for that, I've got to be connected to God. Well, I opened this with telling you about Warren, didn't I? What do you think happened? Six months later, Warren caught up to me. I was speaking down in Hinsdale, Illinois. And the lady of the house answered the phone, and Warren says, is Mr. Holmberger there? She says, Yes. And so I went to the phone and picked up the phone. Warren said to me, Jim. I says, is this Warren? He says, yes, Jim, it is. I said, how have you been? He says, he says Jim, we had that child. I says, did you get your boy? He says, yes, it's a boy. And then his voice trailed off. The phone just went absolutely silent. I could, I could sense that my friend Warren was wrestling with something. And then he said to me, he says, Jim, my son was born with three holes in his heart. I need your God. What if I went to listen to God six months before? What if I went to been under the auspices of God? What if I went to been abiding under his wing six months before? Now this man doesn't need my church. He doesn't need my doctrines. He doesn't need my diet. He doesn't need my outreach. He needs a real God. 
And now I'm standing on holy ground and I am weeping on the phone. I am shivering because now I've got the opportunity to introduce him to the God that changed me. And the God that will change you. And the God that's reaching out to his heart. That's my God. He never stops pursuing the worms. What a God. That's why I love him. I don't follow God because I'm going to go to heaven. I don't care if he gives me heaven or not. I follow God because he, he loves me. And I can't help but do anything else. It has nothing to do with a reward. If God says there's no heaven for you, Jim Armberger, I say I'll still follow you today. If when I die, I go in the grave and that's it, that's all right for me. It's not because we get a reward, it's because we love him. I don't, I'm not married to my wife because she serves me. I'm married to my wife because I love her. Amen. I love her. I love what's under her fifth rib. It's her heart. Why do you serve God? For the gifts that he gives to you? For your reward in heaven? Or do you really love him? It's when I fell in love with God, he did a new thing in my life. And I want people to fall in love with God. Now I've got a chance not to introduce Warren to systematic theology or standard churchianity, I got a chance to tell Warren, guess what, Warren? God's going to be with you as little Nicholas goes through the surgery. God's going to strengthen you. You can go to your knees. God will be there with you. Oh, he'll be an unseen God, but he'll guide you through it. You can give your emotions to him. He'll take you through it. He won't let you down. I'll let you down. My church will let you down. Your understanding of the truth will let you down, but my God won't let you down. He'll be there with you with Nicholas. And I was able to tell him about God, a personal God, a God that he needs. And guess what? Warren picked up the pursuits. Praise God for the Warrens. He started attending church. He started reading the Bible. Warren became involved. He became active. He became religious. Warren was put on the social committees of the church. Warren was put on the church board. Warren was put on the nominating committee. Poor Warren. <laughs> you know. You've been there, haven't you? Now he's going to find out the saints aren't all saints. Isn't that right? Yeah. One year later, Warren calls me. Actually, it was Warren and Sharon called me. He says, Jim, can we come and see you and Sally? I says, Warren, come. And they came up to our little log cabin in the wilderness, and Warren says, Jim, I'm confused. We are not experiencing what you shared with us on the phone. What's wrong? I said, Warren, tell me your story. Warren talked for the next two hours. When Warren was finished, I looked at Warren. I said, Warren, what you have pursued is religion and not God. You attend weekly services. You have accepted the doctrines and the lifestyle. You've entered into the reforms. But quite often, these become a substitute for God himself. And I said, Warren, religion isn't enough. God is a person, he is not a denomination. God is a person, he is not a creed, a routine, a ritual, or a reform, but he's a person, and God can be known and experienced daily, hourly, throughout the routine of your day. This experience Warren was missing. He found religion, not the person. How about you? That's my concern for you, brothers and sisters, today to find the person, not just the church. You know what Warren said to me? <laughs> I like this guy. I wish he was here today. He's about 6'2 and probably 200 pounds. Great big fella. And as I told you, he's a CPA. What do CPAs do if they come into your business? What do they want to do right away? They want to go right, right to the bottom line. Are you profitable or not profitable? So Warren looks at me and says, make it simple, Jim. Just, I mean, just make it simple. I mean, I didn't have hours to prepare or anything. Just make it simple. Cut through the chase, Warren is saying. Bring it down and tell me how it is. Oh, Lord. May God help me. I'm sitting there, but by God's grace in the last six years to this point, I learned how to rest in Jesus. No matter what the situation was, I had to learn to say, Jesus, you're in charge. You now you're going to have to, now my carrots and bananas are important, aren't they? Because <laughs> my mind needs to be cleared of everything. And I need to have a what? A connection. Union and communion with God. God's real. 
It isn't just the knowledge of his word. How do you want me to apply that word now, God? I can't just apply his word according to my understanding. I need God through his Holy Spirit to show me how to apply his word. Otherwise, just Jim Hohenberger. You don't need Jim Hohenberger. You need a transparent Jim Hohenberger where God is working through. So Jim Hohenberger gets out of the way. And so God can be there. So I'm praying to God, I say, God, this guy wants me to make it simple. I don't know what I'm going to say. So I said, Lord, make it simple. <laughs> and then I just shared with him the three thoughts that came to my mind. I said, there's three things, Warren, I want to share with you. I said, first, Warren, in Psalms 46.10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. I'd rephrase it this way. This would be the Jim's revised version. Be still in order to know that I am your God right here and right now. And I looked at Warren. I said, Warren, would you say that the lifestyle you're presently living allows you any room to be still and know daily? You know what Warren did? He laughed. Then he sighed. And then he looked at me and says, that's why you live the way you do. I says, precisely, Warren. I says, Warren, until you slow down, and simplify your life, all you're going to experience is religion and not God. I says, Warren, where we live out in the wilderness, we, live, we look out on Glacier National Park, the Rocky Mountains, the snow-covered peaks. It's beautiful. We got a front porch. By the way, we're having an open house the last week of July in our property. All you are invited. Everybody's invited. Come on up. Last week of July, everybody was invited to our open house. You can camp up down by the river there. And so I said, look out on my front porch. I said, you see a treadmill out there? I said, every morning you'll find me on that treadmill. Somewhere it's between 4.30 and 5.30 in the morning. And I go out on my treadmill. And I get on my treadmill. I say, good morning, Lord. Sometimes there's even a grizzly bear right out because we planted our whole yard to clover to bring in all the wildlife. Sometimes there's a grizzly bear. We got one grizzly bear. He is so lazy. You ought to watch this guy. He's a big brute of a bear. He comes in, and he's eating the clover, and he lays down on his belly with all fours laid out. He won't even get up. All he does is pulls his paws forward and pulls himself in the next patch. <laughs> Real cute guy. You ought to see this guy. I mean, it's comical to watch these guys. He's about 20 yards from me, and I'm on my treadmill. I start out at 4.5 miles an hour. I say, good morning, Lord. I'm here for you. Now speak to me. I don't go to God with a shopping list. I say, God, you speak to me first. And I said, now speak to me, Lord, I'm here for you. And then my treadmill, I go up to five miles an hour, and then I go to six miles an hour and seven miles. I got an automatic program in there. It just does it automatically for me. And when I get up to six, seven, eight, nine, ten miles, my treadmill goes 11 miles an hour. And when I'm going 11 miles an hour, I can't talk to God and I can't hear God. And I looked at Warren. I said, Warren, how fast are you on your treadmill down in San Francisco? You know what he said? 15 miles an hour. I said, Warren, you can't hear God at 15 miles an hour. You gotta slow it down. Are you with me, folks? Now, how fast are you people in Grants Pass going? I had one man come up to me. He says, Jim, after hearing you on your sermon, I'm on two treadmills and they're going two different speeds. <laughs> and he says, I don't hear God. I say, I won't hear God either. God says, be still. And know that I am God. And the devil says, I'm going to destroy the Christians. I'm going to put them on the treadmill. And they're going to go so fast that they'll never hear the still, small voice of God. Welcome to the USA, the hardest place in the world to find God. It is the hardest place. Don't feel bad for the people in the third world countries. They're better off than you are. Much better off. This is the hardest place in the world to find God. The devil has designed it that way. And so I told Warren my, the story. And he looked at me, he says, Jim, he says, you mean I got to move to the wilderness? And I said, no, Warren, this is not about moving to the wilderness. But what you need is a wilderness experience where you're at. You're not made righteous by location. Is that right? Or the heathen tribes in Africa would be more righteous than us. It's not location that makes you righteous. We all have to have a wilderness experience, but we don't have to go to the wilderness to find it. Are you with me? Okay. 
And I said, Warren, you can start right where you are by simplifying your life, regaining your time for God and family. It takes no special talents, no great sums of money, only a determination to possess this experience. Guess what? Warren slowed down and refocused. Praise God for the Warrens. I mean, and so he looked at me. I like Warren. I really wish he was here because I'd like to reenact this with Warren. He looks at me and says, what else, Jim? Just like that. It's like, come on, pop it out. And I'm just saying, what else, Lord? You heard Warren. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Isn't that what Samuel said? Speak, Lord, for thy what? Servant Jim Hornberger needs to hear. He's a real God. And I looked at Warren. I says, Warren, where you are, God is. He says, huh? I said, where you are, God is. Genesis 28, 16 says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Did you hear that? He says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. How can you be a Christian, have the Lord in the place, and you don't know about it? Now, either you're following God or you're not. See, a Christian is someone who's under the influence of the Holy Spirit at the present moment. That's a Christian. Now, are you under the influence of the Holy Spirit in the present moment? If you're not, you're in charge. That's what got Lucifer in trouble, and that's what got Adam and Eve in trouble when they decided to be in charge of their life. See, where you are, God is. And if God is there, you've got to be recognizing his presence with you. And when we grasp the reality of God as our constant companion, our constant guide and counselor, then we simply need to cultivate a sense of his presence and be motivated to act on his guidance. This is how it works. Taking you back a number of years, this is when we were homeschooling our boys. Our boys now are 24 and 26. They both married just virtuous young ladies. They both have their own... Uh, businesses and they live out in the country now but when we were raising them homeschooling them I looked at my wife one fall afternoon and I said honey I just need one more load of wood to get in for the winter and so I'm gonna go out and get one more load of wood and I'll be back so I took my my vehicle had a utility trailer behind it and I drove up to an area where there's some deadfalls and there was this one tree that had fallen down during a windstorm it was a big lodge pole pine and it was up on a cliff, about 25 feet high. So I parked my vehicle and my utility trailer just below the cliff. And I went up to that tree and I started my steel chainsaw and I started cutting it in uh, 16 inches lengths. And I cut through 16 inches, it would drop to the ground. I take my heel, kick it backwards, and it would roll down to my trailer. This is a good program. And so I go to the next, you know, 16 inches, cut through it, drop down, kick it with my foot, roll down to the trailer, and I move to the next one. And then the Lord taps me on the shoulder and says, Jim, I want you to go to the other side of the tree. You see what had happened, and I didn't recognize, is when this tree fell in the windstorm, it was loaded with a lot of kinetic energy like a bow and arrow. Are you with me? And now it's coming to right where the tree, it was connected to this other tree and was holding back all this kinetic energy, and I was going to be cutting through it, and guess what was going to happen? And the Lord taps me on the shoulder and says, Jim, I want you to go to the other side of the tree. And I says, I don't want to. <laughs> Do you know there's a bumper sticker out there I hate? Do you know what it is? Has any of you ever seen it? The Lord is my co Who said that? You've seen that bumper sticker. I hate that bumper sticker. Because if the Lord is my co-pilot, who's the pilot? I am. And if I'm the pilot, I'm headed for what? Who am I right now cutting this wood? Lord taps me on the shoulder. I want you to go to the other side of the tree. Who's the pilot? Jim Homer, the stubborn German you see in front of me. I'm headed for trouble. And so, you know what my problem with God is? I'm going to be honest with you. You know what my problem with God is? He never tells me why. See, if God would say, Jim, I want you to go to the other side of the tree so you don't kill yourself because this log is going to let loose all this kinetic energy. So, well, okay, I'll do it. But God expects me to exercise what? No. Is that right? I've got to exercise. I mean, I've just got to be willing to do whatever God asks, and he doesn't have to explain himself. He said, go through the Red Sea, Moses. People said, can you part it first? God says, stick your finger in it, you know, or your big toe. 
And God expects us to trust him. And so this is my problem with God. If he would explain everything to me, I'd cooperate with him, but he doesn't. And so now I've got to to trust that God knows better than Jim Ohnberger. And so God asked me a third time, now Jim, go to the other side of the tree. Isn't he long-suffering? Maybe with you Hispanics and you French, maybe only ask twice. But us boneheaded Germans, he's got to ask sometimes more than three times. And I said, Lord, is that you? And God impressed me, yes, it is. I says, okay, Lord, I'll go to the other side of the tree. So I went to the other side of the tree. I cut through, and that tree just sprung out across that cliff. And I could actually visualize myself flying backwards with this chainsaw in my hand. And then I would have ended up in the hospital, and I would have said, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? Isn't that what we do? We blame God. Yeah. See, where you are, what? God is. Wherever you're at, God is there. And we have to learn how to be quick to respond to the guiding voice of his Holy Spirit. That's what it means you are saved by grace and not of yourself. I was saved by what? Grace. Saved isn't something that happened to me 12 years ago. Saved is something that's got to happen to me today. Now, when I'm cutting this wood, I need to be saved from the stubborn German personality I have. That's what it means to be saved. Grace is merely God's presence with you, tapping you on the shoulder, trying to get your attention, and trying to say, Jim, I want to save you. Oh, that's a good God, isn't it? That's why Jesus said it was imperative that he leave, that he might send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, that he might be with all of us at the same time. So where you are, God is. But I've got to open that gift of grace, don't I? I have to be willing to cooperate from a free moral agency standpoint and say that God knows more than Jim Ohnberger. Yeah. That's the difficulty God has with his people. I was asked after we went into the ministry and the work that we're doing now, I eventually gave the real estate practice away and God asked me to just go out and help his people be successful. One of the first calls I received was to go to New Zealand and to... uh, speak for a 30-day tour over there. And as I was touring New Zealand, it's a beautiful country, but how many have been to New Zealand? Just a beautiful country, isn't it? I mean, you can look at the ocean and see the seals. You can look up at the grassland and see all the sheep. Then you can look up at the rugged mountains all in one sweep. Just a gorgeous country. And as they're traveling me through the country to speak every night at different locations and different churches, one day about 10 o'clock in the morning, and you know they drive on the wrong side of the road there. You know that, don't you? And the crazy steering wheel's on the right side of the car, it's not on the left side. So I'm sitting in what I call the driver's seat for America. But I'm sitting there, I'm enjoying all the scenery, just enjoying it. It's one of the fringe benefits of preaching around the world. You get to see the world. And all of a sudden, the Lord taps me on the shoulder and suggests to me, Jim, I want you to close your eyes. I don't want to close my eyes. I mean, Lord, I want to look at everything. And when the Lord does this, I don't mean I audibly hear anything, do I? If I ever audibly heard anything from God, I think I would fall to my knees pretty quick. But through the impressions of your mind, through the conscience, God quietly speaks to all of us. And I said, I don't want to close my eyes. And again, this is the problem I have with God. If God would tell me why, I would do it. But he doesn't. And after a couple passes at me, I finally said, is that you, Lord? And the Lord says, yes. I said, okay, I'll close my eyes. So I I closed my eyes, and all of a sudden, a boulder hit the windshield, fell off a cliff we were coming through, and smashed the windshield. And the glass fragments went up my eyebrows, into my nose, into my ears, and down my shirt. I sat sat there and quivered, for if I wouldn't have opened my I wouldn't have closed my eyes, what would have happened to Jim Ohnberger? Isn't God good? See, where you are, God is. We all need to cultivate a sensitivity to the divine influences that the lightest whisper of Jesus will move our souls. That's what I'm trying to tell Warren. Be still and know that he's your God. Realize that where you are, God is. Now cultivate a sensitivity to God's presence with you until it becomes a reality of your life 
and your day and then guard it. This is how Enoch walked with God. And you and I, Warren, must be careful, very careful, lest self-sufficiency comes in. We drop Jesus out and we work in our own strength. So the first one is what? Be still and know that I am God. Second one is where you are God is. Third one is seeing him who is invisible. We must be able to see God in every situation and realize that we can go to God for our defense or our offense. Sal and I were flying into Greenville, Tennessee to speak. And I had Andrew, our youngest one, with us. They speak with us too. And we get into Delta Airlines and we're sitting there in about four or five rolls ahead of us, they bring this screen down and they start playing this junk on the TV screen. I can't believe it. I brought my boys up in the wilderness to shield them from this. I said to my son, Andrew, I said, pray. He says, Father, what are you going to do? I said, son, pray. I'm going to go talk to the flight attendant. And my son's thinking, oh, here goes father again. <laughs> and so I went to the flight attendant and I said, ma'am, please don't play that. She says, sir, write a letter. I says, ma'am, if you play that, I'm going to have to go back to my seat and ask God to put a glitch in it. Now, please don't play that. And she says, sir, write a letter. So I went back to my seat and I said, son, pray. Wife, pray. We played and guess what? Glitch came on. The whole thing started scrambling up and it didn't work. I said, praise God. Isn't God good? Don't you like God? And the lady comes on the, the loudspeaker and she says, you know, I don't know what's happening. She knew what was happening. <laughs> she knew what, this is a showdown between God and the devil. And this lady says, I don't know what's happening. I'll rewind. And I went back up to her and I tapped on her shoulder. Ma'am, don't do that. If you rewind this thing, I just got to go back there and pray again. Now, please don't do this. <laughs> so she rewinds this thing and she puts it back up and it glitches again. I said, God's good, isn't he? I love God. You must live in the unseen world, not the seen world. God's there for you. The Bible says, ask not, receive not. Yeah, God's good. So a lady comes back on the loudspeaker and says, I'm going to give all you people your $5 back. You made people pay money for that junk? And this lady, she's walked uh, come, come behind the aisle from me and I couldn't help resist when she got right alongside of me. You know, she's giving the money back to the people. I just sat there and went, My God's good, isn't he? Yeah. You must see him who is invisible. This is the experience of all the great men that have ever lived. Hebrews 11 talks about him. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and it ends with Moses. In Hebrews 11, 27, it says, By faith Moses forsook Egypt. It's saying here, by faith Moses says, I'm getting out of this confusion. I'm not going to live in San Francisco anymore. I'm leaving. I'm departed. It says, by faith Moses forsook the confusion. Now I've got a question to ask you. If you, Moses was living your lifestyle where you are right now, could he have become Moses? Can you answer that? I see people going, no. Well, what are you going to do? Honestly, brothers and sisters, if Moses living your lifestyle could not have become Moses, what does that say for you? By faith, Moses forsook the confusion. He forsook the riches and the acclaim, the power, the possessions. And it goes on to say, not fearing the wrath of the king. So many people, when I tell them the cost of what it's going to take to hear God's voice and the change of their lifestyle, not that they go to the wilderness to do that, but where they might have to do it right where they're at, they fear the wrath of the king. They fear what the church is going to say. They fear what mother and father are going to say. They fear what their friends are going to say. It says here, Moses did not fear the wrath of the king. He did what he had to do regardless of people's expectations, regardless of what people are going to think of you. People thought Sal and I were nuts when we went to the wilderness. The church didn't support us. Our family didn't support us. Our friends didn't support us. They all thought we were fanatics. And by their standards, we were. Maybe we got to get a little fanatical. Yeah. We didn't fear the wrath of the king. We said, we've got to do what God is asking Jim and Sally Holmberger to do. He said, oh, you're just going to go up in the wilderness and hide and wait for God to return. No, we're not going up there. We're going to fix our marriage. 
We're going to go there and raise some godly children. We're going to go there to find a walk with God so then we can go out and tell others how to do the same. When God gives you something, you can't hold it like the Dead Sea. You've got an obligation to go back out to God's people, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He never, it says, Moses never lost sight of his face. What an experience. He retained a sense of his abiding presence with him. God was real to him in the moment. This is what made Moses bold and courageous, invincible and humble. That's why he could stand before Pharaoh undaunted. Moses had a deep sense of the personal presence of God. Do you? That is what we have to find as a people. And all the men that have most nobly lived for God had a sense of his abiding presence with them. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And the king says, well, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Says, do what you're going to do. And when he looked in the fiery furnace, there was one like unto the Son of God with them. God's presence is with you. When they looked at Daniel and said, if you pray like that, we're throwing you in a lion's pit. I mean, those guys have real claws and teeth. When they threw Daniel in the lion's den, the lions shut their mouth because the lions sense God's presence with Daniel. When God is with you, nothing can touch you unless it goes to God first. All the great men experienced the presence of God with them, and not lions and not fiery furnaces could ever touch them. <coughs> that is to be our experience. God is no respecter of persons. It's open and available to each and every one of us. This is the key to the Christian life. To all that search for it with all their heart, mind, and soul, the devil's power is broken. And that's what I wanted for Jim Homer. I wanted his power to be broken over me. I wanted to treat my wife like a queen. So I did something fanatical, and it worked. And you can do it fanatical too right here in Grant's Pass. Do you right now sense the invisible presence of God calling to your heart? What is God saying to you right now? If he's speaking to you, you must cultivate this until it becomes the biggest thing in your life. He wants to be your present helper. He wants to empower you to live above your flesh, to live above the world, above your habit and inclination. It is when the world sees us being saved in the present rather than just saved from our past that they're going to want our religion. They're going to want to come into our church. And they're not going to come into our church because our doctrines are all right, because we're the remnant church. They're going to come into this church when they see families loving each other, brothers and sisters loving each other, husbands that treat their wives like queen. They're going to say, we're bringing our friends. That's real evangelism. It goes beyond an intellectual sense to the truth because it's experiential. And they can come in and they can see if you're just like them or if you're really walking with God. They know the difference. That's how you evangelize the world. This experience is, in with, is within reach of all if we will reach out and touch Jesus. That's the issue. One of my favorite stories, and I'll close with this, it's found in Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48. It's the it, woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. This is one of my favorite stories in all the scriptures. This woman had spent all her means a trying to get better on physicians and remedies, but to no benefit. But she knew that if she could just reach out and touch Jesus, the hem of his garment, she knew by faith she would be healed. But there was a crowd that pressed about Jesus on every side of him. Hundreds had been brushing up against him all day long, so much so that she could barely make her way through the crowd. But she pressed forward, saying, If I may touch the hem of his garment... And immediately when she touched his hem, she was made whole. Now there's three people in the story. I want you to ask yourself who you are in this story. There were the disciples, the followers of Jesus. They had pressed up against Jesus all day long, and they received no benefit. Why? This woman comes in and just touches the hem of his garment and the very disciples, the hand-picked disciples of Jesus had received no benefit. Who are you? 
Are you one of those disciples receiving no power, no healing? Or are you like this poor woman that says, if I can just touch Jesus? And then there was the throng that crowded about Jesus. They pressed about him. They were following him. They loved his miracles. They loved the benefits of Jesus. They pressed up against Jesus all day long and no benefit to them all except for one lonely woman who dared to touch Jesus differently. And when I got done talking to Warren, I looked at Warren like I'm looking at you right now. I looked at Warren, I says, Warren, it's one issue. How are you going to touch Jesus? That's the issue we all got to deal with, brothers and sisters. How are you going to touch Jesus from here on out? Because that's where the power is. And that's where I go every hour of every day. That's where grace is imparted to me to preach and to write. It's through his power that I am healed. So I'm determined for the rest of my life, I must, I must touch Jesus like this woman touched her. Would you kneel with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, you have been in our sanctuary. You've been in our prayers today. You've been in the music today. You've been in the special music. And Lord, I've sensed you've been in the preaching too. I've sensed that you use the speaker as a, as a transparent instrument to speak to your people today. And as these people have heard you speak to them today, Lord, I pray they will be different when they leave here. I pray that they will not have just found religion, but they will have found a new experience in you. I pray that when they leave here, they will learn to be still and know that you are their God, that where you are, they are, and they can come to you for anything, that they can live in the invisible world, Lord, not just the seen world, and they can press about you, and you can empower them to become all that you have called them to. May they rely upon you now as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.